We're in Acts chapter 1 tonight. Acts chapter number 1. We'll look at verses... Yeah. We'll look at verses 23 through 26 in just a matter of a few seconds. I've entitled the message tonight, A History of the Casting of Lots. A History of the Casting of Lots. Acts chapter 1. Uh, we're bringing it into the context here, so I'll set the scene real quick. Um, what happened here is this is after, this is after the uh, Lord Jesus Christ has ascended into heaven. And so the, the disciples are going to gather in the upper room. This is going to be about the uh, upper room meeting where there's 120 uh, brethren there. And they're going to replace... Judas. Now, of course, we all know how Judas met his demise. He sold Christ in the, he sold Christ with 30 pieces of silver, tried to get it back, was ultimately told no. He went, he hanged him, he offed himself. So now they're going to, now um, Peter are, is going to replace Peter and the men here are going to replace Judas with another apostle. And we, we know uh, from the study we've been doing recently that in order to be an apostle, they had to have seen the they had to have seen the resurrection of Christ. So that so the, uh, so they appointed two men here, and now now we're going to be able to pick, uh, pick up where where I'm supposed to. Verse twenty three of Acts chapter one. The Bible says, and they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabas, who was surnamed Justice. And Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots. And the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity you've given us to look at your word tonight. And now, Lord, I just pray that your word would speak to us and help me to say only what your word would have to say and that you would, you would get all the honor and the glory. We would, be challenged, we would be encouraged and challenged by your word tonight. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. So the disciples had narrowed the list down to two who directly witnessed the, the resurrection of Christ. Barsabas, who is only mentioned twice in Scripture, our text here, and Acts chapter 15, verse 22. You don't have to turn there. And Matthias, who is again only mentioned twice by name in Scripture, both of which is in our text. Now here the Bible says that they prayed and then cast lots. The lot fell upon Matthias, and so he was chosen to replace Judas as his twelfth apostle. Now despite the fact that he's only used twice in Scripture, it doesn't necessarily mean he wasn't important. There are many Bible characters who only get a handful of mentions by name. But that doesn't necessarily minimize their importance in that time. It could have meant they had a quiet ministry. Maybe their ministry, maybe their ministry was just as important as the big names that we read permeated throughout Scripture. But the disciples here use a somewhat rather unorthodox method to determine the will of God. They indeed prayed. But then they cast lots. That brings up an interesting question. Wouldn't you like to know where our lots are today? Where are our lots? What ever happened to the casting of lots? And so tonight, that's what I want to. That's what I want to look at. What happened to the casting of lots? But first, before we answer that question, I'd like to learn more about these lots, and I'm sure you would too. There are approximately 80 to 90 references, mostly rep 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 repetitive, to the biblical term Lot. Now, this is not to be confused with the biblical character Lot, who, because he went to Sodom and ran away from God's will and deserted Abraham, he got in a lot of trouble. Let's turn with me to Leviticus chapter 16. We'll be doing a little bit of scripture uh, reading tonight, so you'll be getting a. We'll have a, teens who are doing our sword drill about three days early this week. <laughs> Leviticus chapter 16. 
Luke is now disappointed because he will not be getting Hershey kisses. <laughs> Leviticus 16. We'll, read, we'll start at verse 7, and we'll read down to verse 10. The Bible says, And he, this is going to be Aaron, shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. Stop there. We see this is the earliest such example of the usage of Lot in Scripture. Here, this is one of the major feast days to the Lord. This is better known as the Day of Atonement. God will ask Aaron to cast two lots upon the two goats presented. One is to have the Lord's lot, and the other is to have the scapegoat lot. The goat that had the Lord's lot was slain for the sins of the Israelites, but the other goat was to be presented alive to God and then let free. This not only symbolized a picture of our sins when we accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior, as, as we may remember from Psalm 103.12, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. But we get an idea of how the lot was used here. God supernaturally, divinely chose which goat was to be sacrificed, and in our text, he chose which apostle was to replace Judas. Now turn with me to Numbers 26. And we're going to look at verses 55 and 56 of Numbers chapter 26. I'm going to read verse 50. I'm going to start in 52 for context. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Unto these the land shall be divided for an inheritance according to the number of names. To many thou shalt give the more inheritance, and to few thou shalt give the less inheritance. To every one shall his inheritance be given according to those that were numbered of him. Notwithstanding the lot, the land shall be divided by lot. According to the names of the tribes of their fathers, they shall inherit. According to the lot shall the possession thereof be divided between many and few. God tells Moses exactly how the promised land was to be divvied up. Now, Moses was not to divvy up the land, but rather his successor, Joshua, was going to be told by God how to exactly where the, which each lot was going to fall. We're going to see that in just a minute. We're going to see exactly how Joshua and how the lot was used by Joshua and by God to divvy up, to, 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 to divvy up the, the promised land into exactly which tribe was going to have each portion. Now, while men could see this perhaps as a game of chance or casting dice, so to speak, but God knew what he was doing and supernaturally allowed it, so each lot fell to the tribe that was to get that specific portion of the land. Moses did divide up the portions east of the River Jordan to satisfy two and a half of the tribes. Also remember that the tribe of Levi had no inheritance because they were serving as priests to each of the tribes. Joshua would later ex- execute the Lord's will to divide up the land by lot, beginning in Joshua chapter 13, and it runs through Joshua chapter 21. So let's look at one such example. Uh, turn me to Joshua chapter 18. Chapter 18, verse number 6 is where we'll start. Actually, we're going to start in verse 2. Beg my pardon. Joshua 18, verse 2 for context. The Bible says, And there remained among the children of Israel seven tribes, which had not yet received their inheritance. And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, How long are ye slack to go to possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers hath given you? Give out from among you three men for each tribe, and I will send them, and they shall rise and go through the land, and describe it according to the inheritance of them, and they shall come again to me. And they shall divide it into seven parts. Judah shall abide in their coast on the south, 
and the house of Joseph shall abide in their coasts on the north. You shall therefore describe the land into seven parts, and bring the description hither to me, that I may cast lots for you here before the Lord our God. But the Levites have no part among you, for the priesthood of the Lord is their inheritance. And Gad and Reuben and half the tribe of Manasseh had received their inheritance beyond Jordan on the east. That's where I mentioned the two and a half tribes over on the other side of the river Jordan. Which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave them. And the men arose and went away. And Joshua charged them that went to describe the land, saying, Go and walk through the land and describe it, and come again to me, that I may here cast lots for you before the Lord in Shiloh. And the men went and passed through the land and described it by cities into seven parts in a book, and came again to Joshua to the host at Shiloh. And Joshua cast lots for them in Shiloh before the Lord. And there Joshua divided the land unto the children of Israel according to their divisions. Now note verse 11. And the lot of the tribe of the children of Benjamin came up according to their families. And the coast of their lot came forth between the children of Judah and the children of Joseph. And in the, verse, the following verses, verses like 12 through about 28, describe exactly where the, Benj the portion of the land for Benjamin, the, the tribe of Benjamin, was to be. The remainder of the tribes, of course, here now, are having lots cast before the Lord to determine which plot of the land they got. Now, no doubt, size of the tribe and loyalty to God, loyalty to God and loyalty to his word and his commandments, also had a hand in God supernaturally determining, by lot, which tribe deserved which portion of the land they would be given. So we see here, so earliest we, so the first couple things we've seen here is that we see the, the first example of the lot, how the lot was used in the Day of Atonement to present a scapegoat and to present a, a, goat, a goat which was to be slain in the Day of Atonement. We saw how the Promised Land was divvied up by lot. Now I'd like to look at another example of how the lot was used. The lot was used to determine the guiltiness of a person. Turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter number 14. Now we're going to be breaking into the context here. We don't have the time to uh, read the whole chapter because that's really, you would get the most gist of the context by reading the entire chapter. But we're going to read verses uh, 41 and 42. I'm going, to, I'm going to set the scene before we read verses 41 and 42. The scene is that Jonathan, the son of Saul, is going to be in a battle with the Philistines. Now... What happened here is earlier in the chapter, Saul had set forth a command to, the, to those in the battle that they were not to partake of any food until the battle had commenced and they had gotten the victory. Now, some of these battles, these weren't exactly eight to five battles, like we have eight to five jobs. These are battles that sometimes went on for days and even longer periods of time. I get hungry after four hours. And I'm fortunate if I even make it four hours. Going all day in battle and possibly even longer? This wasn't exactly the best request Saul could have made. But nevertheless, since Saul made it, it technically was law. It was to go as law. They're in a battle with the Philistines. They had been charged by Saul to not eat until they had won. But Jonathan was not aware of the charge, as you see, you can see that in verse 24 for yourself. In fact, I'll read verse 24. And the men of Israel were distressed that day. For Saul had adjured the people, saying, Cursed be the man that eateth any food until evening, that I may be avenged of mine enemies. So none of the people tasted any food. Verse 27. But Jonathan heard not when his father charged the people with the oath. Wherefore he put the forth the end of the rod that was in his hand, and dipped it in a honeycomb, and put his hand to his mouth, and his eyes were enlightened. Going to start or stop right there. When word got to Saul here of the feast the Calvary had had, which we see in the following verses, he, he called for all of them to stand before him. 
Of course here we saw that eating was not a sin, but rather it was, be it was because they disobeyed his charge and that they also ate blood, which was of course forbidden in the laws given to them in the book of Leviticus. He first cast lots between him himself with Jonathan and the people. So him and, J him and Jonathan had one lot. Everybody else, just one lot. We'll see that in verse, verse 41. Therefore Saul said unto the Lord, God of Israel, give a perfect lot. And Saul and Jonathan were taken, but the people escaped. So now, it's just Saul and Jonathan. So he goes, all right, verse 42. And Saul said, cast lots between me and Jonathan, my son. And Jonathan was taken. So Saul and Jonathan, the lot's going to fall on Jonathan. Jonathan would confess the act. Verse 43. Then Saul said to Jonathan, Tell me what thou hast done. And Jonathan told him and said, I did but taste a little honey with the end of the rod that was in my hand, and lo, I must die. And Saul answered, God do so, and more also, for thou shalt surely die, Jonathan. But note the people intervening here. Verse 45. And the people said unto Saul, Shall Jonathan die who hath wrought this great salvation in Israel? God forbid, as the Lord liveth, there shall not one hair of his head fall to the ground. For he hath wrought with God this day. So the people res rescued Jonathan, that he died not. So we saw that even the lot here was used to determine God's will. And in this case, we still see that God so moved in hearts and lives in causing the people to realize, no, Saul, you should not take Jonathan for this. And Jonathan was spared. When Israel returned to the land after the Babylonian Persian captivity, they cast lots. We're not going to turn there, but you can see that example in <clears> Nehemiah <throat> chapter 10, verses 30, verse 34. But I want you to turn with me to Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs 16, we're going to look at verse 33. And here we're going to see one of the reasons lot were ca lots were cast in Scripture in great detail. Solomon says, The lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. When an important decision needed to be made in the Old Testament, and even up to the point of the men here in our original text back in Acts chapter number 1, the Lord allowed the usage of the lot to be the determiner of his will. And that's interesting to find. So at that time, they were using lots. In Proverbs 18, verse 18, the Bible says, The lot causes contention to cease and parteth between the mighty. There was no need, there was to be no need for arguing, because the lot determined God's will every time, so it was used for good, and God gave his okay for usage of such a tool. That's one thing I wanted to note there, too. That even though they used, they used lots at this time, that God supernaturally allowed this. This was not a game of chance. This was, this was a way of determining the will of God. Now here's a way God used the lot to change direct, somebody's direction. I'd like to turn with, us, turn with me to Jonah chapter 1. Trust we're all familiar with the uh, account of Jonah. If you're not, it's only four chapters. Verse four for con verse three for context. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He didn't want to go to Nineveh, and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and that there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God. Lois notice the lowercase g, so they're crying out to their individual gods and not the God of heaven. And cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea, to lighten it of them. 
But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came unto him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God. Notice the capital G. If so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. And they said, Every one to his fellow, Come, and let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Then they said unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for, which, for whose cause this evil is upon us? What is thine occupation? And whence comest thou? What is thy country? And of what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am in Hebrew, and fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that they had fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. They knew. These were experienced mariners. These weren't some people out on a three-hour joyride on the ocean. These were experienced mariners who had spent many, many times crossing the Medi various points of the, of the great Mediterranean. But they had never seen such a storm as the one that God had supernaturally brewed up here. This reminds me of the meteorological phenomenon known as the perfect storm that occurred off the New England coastline in 1991. A ship named the Andrea Gale and its crew attempted to return home to Massachusetts after a fishing expedition and decided to try to go through the storm to return home. And they would later capsize and all on board sadly perish. And this much, but as big and as, as it was one of the most, one of the biggest, rarest storms to ever occur off that coastline but yet even those men those men had been had been through some storms but even they weren't prepared for the perfect storm what was so what is meteorologically known as the perfect storm as much as these mariners had gone through and had experienced on the Medi on the great mediterranean they were not prepared for this they knew this would had to be something different and indeed it was because this was going to be used to bring jonah back in the line with God's will. They gathered to cast lots amidst the turbulent seas, and the lot fell upon the man who was sleeping, the prophet Jonah. Well, they may have believed they had randomly selected one to be guilty, God overruled and made sure his man was the guilty party. Let's view one final example of lots, and we're going to need to go see this in the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 27. This lot, however would not be used to glorify God, but rather this usage of the lot was used to fulfill Old Testament prophecy. Matthew chapter 27. In Matthew 27, look with me at verses 34 and 35. Here the Bible says, they gave him, that would be Christ, he's on the, he's on the cross, and they gave him vinegar to, mit, to drink mingled with gall, and when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. The usage of the lot here was to gamble, to determine who got the vesture of the dying Lord upon the cross of Calvary. This, by the way, is one of the very few events of the crucifixion hours described in all four of the gospel accounts. The prophecy was spoken of by David in Psalm 22, verse 18. I'll read that for you. As he says, David says here in Psalm 22, verse 18, they part, they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. And sure enough, nearly a thousand years later, the, soul, the Roman soldiers are gambling for his very cloak. So all that took place chronologically before our original text in Acts chapter 1, where we saw how the lot was used to 
determine which which person was to be the next apostle. So here's the here's the question we've been looking to get to all night. Why don't we cast lots today? Our answer starts with a look at John chapter 16 and verse number 13. In John 16, the Lord is speaking to us and he says, How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that he shall speak, and he will show you things to come. Note the phrase, he will guide you in all truth. Christ promised to us the Comforter, that is the Holy Spirit, to the believers after his death and resurrection. And the Holy Spirit will now live and, reign, will now live and abide in every believer. He indwells each believer at the moment of their conversion to Christ and stays until that person passes away or is raptured, convicts them of sin, and teaches them how to grow as Christians. Relating back to our text, the disciples in Acts chapter number 2 finally receive the Comforter to guide them and help them in decision making. Of course, one must still pray, but now there would no longer be the need to cast lots when deciding what God would have them to do. So that's why we don't cast lots today. We have the Holy Spirit. We have, each believer has the Holy Spirit. We don't need to cast a lot to determine what should... We don't need the lot at 5.30 at night on Wednesday evening to tell us what to do. Should I go to church today? Yes or no? You don't need to cast lots there. You pray about it. You don't even need to pray about it. You should know, you know better that you should be that if you're not physically hindered or whatever the or whatever some other case may be, you should be in the house of the Lord, as of course Hebrews ten twenty five tells us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Some things you don't need to pray about. There are other but there are other big decisions that you need to pray, and let the Holy Spirit guide you. There are many many aspects of the lives. Let's view two examples of the Holy Spirit in action guiding believers. And so I'd like to start here in Acts chapter number 13. Start at, one, start at verse 1. The Bible says, Now there were certain in the church, were in the church that was at Antioch, certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simon and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene, and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost, not a lot, but the Holy Ghost, said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I had called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. <clears throat> Many believers were gathered at this church of Antioch, including the list given in verse 1. But note verse 2. What would they have done, perhaps maybe even 50 years sooner, and they needed men to go out? They would have prayed. Perhaps they would have even fasted. But, they might, but back then they might have cast lots. But now we see here that the Holy Spirit is guiding them to say, separate Saul, Saul and Barnabas for the work I have called unto them. The Spirit was now guiding the believers. Not only does this teach of the Holy Spirit's guidance in one life, but also as an interesting side note, it teaches that the, that, um, uh, never mind. This teaches of the Holy Spirit's guiding in the life of a believer. Another such example is Acts chapter number 16, verses 6 through 10. Don't worry, we're just about done looking at different passages. Sword drill's almost over for the evening. Acts 16, verse 6. Now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach to Asia, there's another interesting instance where the Holy Ghost tells them not to go into a certain area. After they were come to Mysia, they, were, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. And they, passing by Mysia, 
came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Here God closed the door on Paul's ministry to two areas, but he opened the door for the Macedonian call, for what we would consider the Macedonian call. That is, of course, a reference to one of the stanzas in the famous hymn, Send the Light, where the song goes, We have heard the Macedonian call today, send the light, send the light. Again, had this occurred perhaps 50 years earlier, Paul would have prayed and cast lots between the lands, and God would have sent Paul into southeastern Europe. Note Paul recalling the need for him to go to Macedonia and God opening that door in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 12. But however, as great an avenue as the Holy Spirit is, we can fail to yield to the Spirit. Turn me to the final passage we're going to look at tonight, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 30. Paul's talking to the believers at the church of Ephesus, and he says in verse 30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. We are told here that we can grieve the Spirit. And when the Spirit is grieved, there can be no guidance, because we are out of fellowship with God. Answers cannot be determined as clearly, because sin has clogged. The conduit that is between the Holy Spirit and us, and between God, and essentially between God and us. And until that we get that right, there is more of a tendency to make bad decisions. Not you will not always make a bad decision being out of fellowship with God, but the likelihood of making a bad decision or a wrong decision is certainly there when we're not in fellowship with God, and when we're induced by self, when we're not right with God. We can be influenced by ourselves and not influenced on scripture, on talking with other believers, on talking with our pastor. So what is our conclusion then? There is no need for believers today to cast lots and to determine the will of God. We have the Holy Spirit, which will guide us into all truth and the avenue of prayer. Together, that should be quite the step toward making such decisions in one's life. How about using wise counsel? Numerous passages in the book of Proverbs indicate that wise counsel may also help a believer to make the right decision. That Proverbs 15.22 is one such passage, but there are others that suggest a Christian should seek other mature Christians, and of course your pastor, when it comes to a big decision. We have wise counsel, we have prayer, we have the Holy Spirit, and we have the completed and perfect Word of God. Amen? God doesn't roll dice with our lives, and neither should we. There's no further need for a believer to, to cast lots. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to look in your word. And Lord, now I just pray that we, we're thank, we thank you for the whole, for your sending your son to die for us. And we're thankful that he left us, not because we didn't want him to leave, but because by him, by him, being, by him going away, he could send us the Holy Spirit a great comforter, the paraclete, to guide, to help us, to help guide us in each and every one of our lives. And Lord, I just pray we would indeed keep the way clear. We would have nothing between you and us, that we would confess sin openly and as early as possible, and allow the Holy Spirit to move in our hearts and lives. We thank you for your word, and we pray now you'll just help us and use us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Prayer requests.